So as I mentioned, we're kind of looking at really a, a unique time. And all of Scripture is special. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to take anything away from that. But when you think about the fact of, of what has happened that we've been looking at over the last two or three weeks, we looked at Jesus' death. We looked at his resurrection. We looked at Peter's restoration. And then we find here that it's been about 40 days since Jesus had, had risen. He, he's appeared about 10 times to his disciples and to other believers. Of course, we know that he appeared to the women at the tomb. We know that he appeared in the upper room with the disciples. We know that he appeared on the road uh, uh, to Emmaus. He's demonstrated to his followers, he's demonstrated to mankind that he was alive by many infallible proofs, as we'll see here in just a moment. And now he has, Jesus has essentially done something extraordinary here. Now he has, he's really called a special meeting. And we're going to kind of look at that this morning. He's this special meeting for those believers that were in Jerusalem. If you've not already, go and take your copy of God's Word. Meet me over in Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And all that can, please stand in honor and in reverence and reading of God's inerrant and infallible Word. So Acts chapter 1 verse 1 says this, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit have given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Notice that. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they watched, notice that, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. May the Lord add his blessings to the ring of his word. Church family, you can be seated. So what we're seeing here is Jesus calling all the followers, all believers to a very special meeting. And notice what happened here. Before we, we get to that place, I want, you to, I want you to miss this. Notice what Luke says here in verse 1. He says, the former account, notice that. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So notice what is happening here. This is Luke acknowledging here to, to his friend, to Theophilus, and he says, he says, notice, I want you to notice that word former account. Well, what is happening here, Luke is, is, is referring back to his gospel. He's referring back to the gospel that he wrote. He's now writing to the same man who he wrote the gospel to, Theophilus. He's, he's kind of reminding him that, that his gospel was written about the life and his life was, his, his gospel was written about the ministry of Jesus here on earth. But I also want you to notice here 
that second phrase of all that Jesus, here it is, began. All that Jesus began. Jesus' life, Jesus' ministry here on earth. Church, it is just the beginning. That was just the beginning. And what, what Luke is writing here, he's saying, he's using the very opening part of, of this very precious book of Acts to really declare and to show something really special here. Look in verse 4 with me. And being assembled together with them, notice this, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So this is a different, different kind of gathering. This is a different type of event that, from what we have, have looked at in the past. Jesus has arranged this time. Jesus has, has called everybody together. So here's kind of the scene, if you will, just kind of picture in your mind's eye, maybe about 500 people or more uh, gathered possibly on a mountaintop somewhere and Jesus then begins to speak and as we just read he begins to speak about the kingdom Jesus had provided many many proofs infallible proofs the word says that he was indeed alive and he he did this so that the the his followers could know he'd kept his promise he did this so that he could his followers could know that he was indeed the messiah so here they are, they've, they've kind of surrounded Christ and there is so much that you could, you could preach in these verses. But where I think God would have us kind of focus on today or hone in on today uh, is the last five verses. So I want to invite you to look with me here in verse 6 and notice this. He says, therefore when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, Jesus had been teaching. He had been preaching about the kingdom. He had, he had promised the apostles that they would sit on thrones. They would, they would be judging the, the, the people of Israel. He would promised believers they would receive a, a hundredfold and would, and would rule over the world. But he'd also taught them so much about, about what love looks like, about what sacrifice looks like. He taught them so much about the kingdom and about what was to happen. Think about the journey we went on with Peter. He taught them so much about what was truly important to him. So here they are. They've called this, this special meeting and Jesus is, he's speaking, and, and one of his disciples, the word doesn't tell us which one, but one of his disciples says, Lord, will you at this time re restore the kingdom of Israel? Lord, are you going to do it now? Lord, are you going to restore the, the, the kingdom of Israel is that why you've called us all together? Lord, is that why we're having this, uh, this amazing meeting? Is this why we're all together? I can almost see the disciples just getting all giddy, thinking that now's the time that Jesus is going to throw the Romans out, and then they are gonna, they're going to sit, and they're going to rule, and they're going to reign. This is the disciples seeking personal power. This is the disciples seeking authority. This is the disciples seeking position, seeking wealth. And you can almost just see Jesus just go, Ugh. Out of everything I've tried to teach you, out of everything I've showed you, the miracles you watched me perform this is where your brain goes to immediately. Church, we need to understand something. What Jesus wanted to do through them was so much more. We need to understand life is not about us. I realize for some of y'all that may come to a shock. But life's not about us. What Jesus 
Man, the, the disciples are thinking, oh, great, we're finally going to have power. We're going to have authority. We're going to be able to tell everybody else what to do. We're going to have position. We're going to have wealth. And what Jesus is saying is, man, what I want to use you for, I want to use you to offer the restoration, to offer the eternal relationship that I went to the cross for so that billions down through the ages might be able to have a forever with Jesus in that place he has prepared. Do you see how one has nothing to do with the other? How one is so far different. The disciples wanted their way. They wanted what they thought was best. They wanted power. They wanted position. They wanted authority. They wanted wealth. And in preparation for today, I was kind of studying through this and I was thinking back. Uh, and I had been praying before the Lord, saying, Lord, now, Lord, I want to go do this, and Lord, I want to go do that, and Lord, I want to. Uh, Lord, I, I'd like to get this done, and Lord, I'd like to get that done, and kind of sharing with the Lord all the things that I wanted to do. And as I'm preparing for the message for today, I'm like, Lord, what was wrong with those disciples? Lord, they were so weak. Lord, here you poured yourself out. Man, they, they watched you die on the cross. They, they experienced 10 times now, Lord. You, face to face, after your resurrection, they know you are who you say you are. Lord, they experienced it all with you. And the best they can come up for is, Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom? And the Lord was like, I thought, Lord, they are so weak. Lord, couldn't you chose a stronger disciple? And the Lord was like, well, wait a minute, not even two hours ago, you were asking me to do what you wanted. Isn't that what we do, church? I mean, let's get real for a minute. Isn't that what we do? Yeah, we do. Yes, we do. It's easy to throw rocks. As my daughter says, it's easy to throw shade, whatever that means. But you know, we need to understand. Sometimes we come to the Lord with our own agendas. We come to the Lord with our own thought processes. We come to the Lord with the things that we want to pursue without ever checking with Jesus. And that's where we get in trouble. Then sometimes we even bring those things to the church, don't we? We come to the church with our own agendas, seeking what we think is best. When what we've got to realize is it's all his. He's the one that gets to make the choice. It's not me. It's not you. We need to go before him and say, Lord, you want us to turn left? You want us to turn right? You want us to go straight ahead, back up, or sit still? We need to always check with him because it's all his. It's not about us. Now look with me verse 8. But you shall receive power. Notice this. Notice what he's promising here. He's saying you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He's saying you're going to receive power. And that power, that power is not power that you have to create yourself. That power is not something that comes from within us. Praise the Lord, we don't have to get up first thing in the morning. It's all I can do to get to the coffee pot. Y'all know what I'm saying? Can I get a witness? Anybody else? I got a few of y'all will admit it. All right. Praise the Lord, I don't have to sit there on the side of the bed like, 
okay, I gotta, I gotta get some power built up here. I gotta get some power built up here so that I can go out and serve the Lord. Uh uh-uh. uh. It doesn't come from us. It's a supernatural power, the very power of God Himself, His Spirit literally indwelling us. Right here this morning, we got a chance to see Julie as she bowed and she fell on her face before the Lord and she cried out to the Lord and she asked the Lord to forgive her sin and she asked the Lord to come into her heart and it was done in that moment. Not only was her name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but we also know that the Holy Spirit indwelled her. Her mama looked at her after she received Jesus and she said, honey, don't it feel good? And with tears flowing through her from her eyes, she said, yes, mama, it does. That's what it's all about, church. Let me try that again. Ben is with me. That's what it's all about, church. There we go. You know, there is no greater power on earth than the power of the Holy Spirit. And he indwells us. And he indwells you. And you. And you. And you. And you. Each and every one of us. That know him as Lord and as Savior. All across the sanctuary. All around the world. He indwells you. If you know him as Lord. He equips us for those spiritual moments. For those those difficult discussions. Very often someone will come to me and they'll say, Hey pastor, I, I got this person that's in my life. That I'm not sure if they know Jesus. And I always say to them, trust the Lord. Trust the Lord to give you the words. Trust the Lord to... To speak through you. Because that's what he does. Sometimes it's that it's a it's a member of our own family. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's a person on the job. Sometimes it's a person that's in the classroom with us that's just a a few desks down. That God says, that one there, they don't know me. And I need you to share my story with them. Sometimes it's the person at the the checkout counter, isn't it? The grocery store. Or the person that always walks up with a smile on their face and takes our order when we order breakfast. The power to share Jesus does not come from something that is within us that we create. It comes from his spirit that indwells us. That's a beautiful thing. Very often I hear people say, well, now, Pastor, I, I really struggle with, with witnessing. I, I struggle with, with sharing Jesus. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it is. Do you know why it's uncomfortable? Because it's spiritual warfare. Satan don't want you to share. Satan don't want you to tell somebody about Jesus. Satan don't want you to share his truth. He don't want you to share his story. And the entire time Jesus is saying, yes. I want you to do this. I have uniquely equipped you and prepared you. Do you realize, I don't care who you are, if you're you're, you're sitting here in the sanctuary or you're sitting on your couch watching us online, there are people that are in your life that you are more equipped to, to reach for Jesus than anybody else in the world. Because he's uniquely equipped you. He's uniquely called you. He's uniquely prepared you. And if you will just let him, the words that will come out of your mouth will be exactly what is needed. Words that I would be incapable of speaking because I'm not you. Yes, it's uncomfortable. But Jesus said, but you shall receive Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The battle is his. The power is his. 
we are but vessels. All he wants us to do is say, here am I, Lord, use me. That's it. That's it. But I want you to notice the pattern here. It begins in our immediate area. It begins with our families. It begins with our neighbors. It begins with our friends, with our coworkers, with our community. And then it branches out from there. It begins with the people that are in the same household with you. And then it goes down the street. And then it works its way out into uh, the different parts of, of, of our great nation until it goes all the way around the world to the ends of the earth. And you know, there's a lot of people that still we need to reach. But the place, one of the places we're struggling with most now is right here in our backyard. Every year we take up a couple of very significant offerings. The first one is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And that's for the International Mission Board. The other one is the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And that's for North American missions, for the North American Mission Board. Eons ago, we used to call that home missions. But we collect money to support those. Both of those are arms of the Southern Baptist Convention. And they take care of raising the money so that they can send missionaries out. And those missionaries don't have to raise their own funds. They don't have to come off the mission field and come back to churches and ask churches to support them. Man, they're able to stay out there in the mission field continuing the work. And the North American Mission Board, International Mission Board, they do an amazing work, an amazing job. Supporting missionaries all over the world. North American Mission Board said back in 2015 that we planted 4,000 churches. Now that's awesome. Challenge is we had 3,700 churches close the doors forever. Over five years later in 2020, unfortunately the numbers really hadn't changed. We have been in a 20-year decline in the number of baptisms, yet right here in, in America, our population has risen by 42 million people. 246 million people in North America do not have a relationship with Jesus. Church family, that is why we go. That's what missions is all about. That's why we give money to Annie Armstrong. That's why we give money to Lottie Moon. So that we support the work of, of those, those missions. But it's more than just giving money. We've also got to go. Just down the street, right here in, in America, and all around the world. Now, you know, I, I know we've been living, living under this dark cloud that has been this global pandemic. And I'm certainly not trying to take any away from that, anything away from that. I know it's been hard. But I need you to hear me. It's time to dream again. It's time not just to dream again, but it's also time to go again. In the days ahead, you're going to be hearing about some opportunities to reach out to our community. You've already heard about a, a couple of them, but we're going to be adding to that. But you've heard about Vacation Bible School. You've heard about Lifeline to Wellness. You're going to be hearing about some others here in the days ahead. Some new opportunities to go on mission, to be on mission right here in our community. You're going to be hearing about some opportunities to, to go on a mission uh, trip right here in America, right here in the United States. And prayerfully, you're going to be hearing about some new opportunities for us to go internationally. It's time. It's time. I realize we've still got to see some numbers drop. We've still got to see some things fall. We're going to trust the Lord for that. Okay? We're going to trust Him when He's done with this pandemic thing. He's going to blow it right out of here and it's going to be time to go. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's right, Beck. Look at verse 9 now. 
Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Notice here Jesus' last words. They're about reaching the world. The last thing he stresses here is the work of the church. That agenda has not changed. May God forgive us for any time we've ever made the church about ourselves as to what we want. Man, I'm going through preparing for this and I had to fall on my face and I had to say, Lord, I'm sorry if I've ever made it about me. About what we want, about our own agendas. Notice here, immediately after speaking the words from verse 8, this most dramatic thing begins to happen. Jesus begins to slowly rise from the earth, ascending ever upward toward the sky that is above. I can almost imagine the disciples standing there with their mouths wide open, just shocked and amazed, gazing at this incredible sight as Jesus just begins to rise. They're witnessing one of the most dramatic, one of the most phenomenal events ever to be experienced. They are personally witnessing the return of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords back to God the Father. The return of God's Son into heaven, into that that spiritual world. Notice here that they watched it. They experienced it. They took it in. The Lord ascends somewhat slowly, but it's in a dramatic, spectacular fashion. Why in the world would he do it like that? I would submit to you, I think it was for the disciples. Jesus had been spontaneously appearing, as I shared with you, in the upper room. He'd been spontaneously appearing for... 40 days now, but this was the last time. This was the last time that it was going to be like this here on earth. And he wanted them to know. He wanted them to know what their task was. He wanted them to know what their job was. And he just laid it all out for them. He had told them that they would be witnesses. And just as he ascended, they knew. Their job was to carry on the work. Their job was to carry on the work. Just as he ascended, he was going to return. That's another proof. And church family, that's a promise he's going to keep too. Look with me in Acts chapter 1 verse 10 now. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So so two men in white are standing in their midst. As Jesus is rising, he's ascending back to God the Father. These two men, they they, they kind of catch the disciples. I can imagine, I can only tell you this is probably what I would look like if I was standing there and I watched Jesus rise. In my mind's eye, I picture 500 people standing on a mountaintop out in the middle of a meadow going like this. Watching Jesus rise. And then two men in white essentially standing there looking at the men, looking up to Jesus, looking at the men and eventually saying, what are y'all doing? There's work to be done. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, he told told two men stood by them in white apparel, notice their message, and who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Enon Baptist Church, 
This same message holds true for us today just the same as it did on that mountaintop. That message for us today could very easily read men and women of Enon Baptist Church. This same Jesus who was taken up into heaven, he's going to come in like manner. And until then, just as with the disciples, there's work for us to do. So my question to you this morning is how about it, church? Are you ready? I realize we're coming out of a global pandemic. I get that. But I do believe we're starting to come out of it. There is work to be done. There's a community to be reached. There's a nation that is lost and in need of a Savior. There's a world out there that needs Jesus. So how about it? Are you ready? As Shannon comes this morning, we're going to have a hymn of invitation, but I want to ask you. Are you ready? The first thing that's required is that you've got to have a relationship with him. Do you? If you don't, if you're sitting there with us watching online and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I want to admit my sin. I believe you have the power to forgive my sin and to save me. I believe you are the Son of God. I want to confess my sin to you and I want to dedicate the rest of my life to serving you. Come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. If you just prayed that prayer, you're a child of God. I want to invite you to give us a call here at the office. For those of you that are watching us online, I thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. Have a blessed day.